Okay, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, okay, because otherwise I've got all sorts of equipment ready to go. And uh, <laughs> because these things happen when you're trying to uh, host an event with live audience and um, also online. And, and like most of you, I spend almost all of my life ministry-wise online now, which has been a, a great experience, actually. It's pulled things out of me that I didn't even know I carried. But anyway, thank you very much, Ibn, for inviting me, for, for hosting this event, and for choosing uh, the amazing topic from resignation to hope because God has called us to hope, not just human hope, but he's called us to, to live our lives in, in his hope. And so that's what we're gonna look at today. It's good to see uh, friends of mine here from the British Isles and from, from um, and it's also good to see um, some people, let me see, I thought I saw some, I know you guys are from Winnipeg and, and I'm pretty sure if I would scroll to the next page, I'd see some Winnipeggers that I know. I know Gaylene, who is going to be sharing with you. And so, so anyway, hello to all of you from where you're, you're watching. The downside of, of doing a Zoom call is that we don't get to know where you're from. Agatha very cleverly put Agatha Winnipeg, and that is excellent. And so if you guys want to change your names and so people know where you're from, you can also do that. And, and that's just a way that we can relate to each other and see who from around the world is joining with us and watching. And of course, there's also people watching, I think, probably on Facebook and, and on YouTube. And uh, that's really exciting that we can spread the word of God in ways that are much bigger and greater. Remember, we're called to greater works than the way we were operating before, which was all huddling in a little room, which is wonderful to do, by the way. But, but God has expanded our borders. And with that, he has expanded and increased our possibility um, to, to, to bring Jesus Christ to the world and that is what this is all about everything that we say and everything that we do has to point to jesus christ hello allison from leicester in the uk hello joe from leicester in the uk and uh adela see some people is it adela abdullah from winnipeg as well that's very fun to see people doing that hello uh to all of you anyway to our topic, <laughs> hope. We are living in a day actually where every single thing I believe that has to do with the kingdom of God is under attack. And it's always has been under attack from the enemy, but right now it seems as if everything has intensified and it's as if the hordes of hell have been released against the people of God haha, <laughs> in a way that we couldn't even have imagined it and it's come very subtly and it's not just the pandemic and what's happened is that this has brought trauma into the body of Christ and a siege mentality to center stage. And what it's doing is robbing life and it's robbing health and it's robbing hope from people. And you know that when people don't have hope in their hearts, they begin to get sick and they give up. And hopelessness begin, becomes their platform. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about replacing hopelessness with hope. Now, it's not just something that is happening to a few people, but this is happening to everyone, absolutely everyone. I am in contact with prophets from all over the world, from believers from all over the world, and they will agree with me that the intensity of the attack of the enemy has, it's as if it's gone up a bunch of notches. And we need to be aware that there is an assignment that the enemy is, uh, is wielding against us. And he's able very often to hook us. And that's the problem. He hooks us and we want to know why he's able to get an inroad with us and able, and he's able to control our minds and our emotions so that hope fades from our lives. So why does it happen? Well, I believe there are many reasons. 
Some of us are unguarded in lots of areas of our lives. We make sure that the front door is there and well guarded that John, the book of John tells us that Jesus is the door, right? And uh, so we know our front door is guarded and then we mistakenly think we're safe. But we forget there's a back door and we forget that there are side doors. We forget that there are windows and we don't position people to pray for those areas in our lives. We don't position ourselves uh, and to pay attention to those things as we should. And sometimes the enemy will come in that way through the back door. And now I know that the enemy cannot touch us unless he has permission from God. He has to go through God. And so that makes me believe there must be lessons that God wants us to learn, lessons we need to pay attention to right now in this season of our life. Because if not, if there were no reason for this, God would stop it in a flash. It would be over. But there are things we are learning. All of you would tell me if I asked you as individuals, you would all tell me that you have learned this and this and this during the lockdown, during the pandemic. All of us can testify to that. All of us can give witness to the goodness of God and how you have changed during the season of difficulty. So we know that God is teaching us. And he wants to teach us to live from a place where we're not living from right now. He's deepening things and choices need to be made, which are not being made. That word resignation that you have on your flyer right at the beginning from resignation to hope is very telltale because resignation is the stance of a victim. You give up. You give up and you don't make good choices and therefore the enemy is allowed and able to rob you. And we want that to stop. But he comes in and he we let the zeitgeist uh, take us where it will, the spirit of this age. And it's sadly, we've given entrance to that, that spirit very often through the lies of human tradition that are not biblical or rooted in truth. And what's happened is that we have exalted our own truth many times above, above biblical truth, which is based and found in Christ Jesus. He is our truth. And we cannot exalt our ideas and our thoughts and our comfortable thinking over the word of God. So when it comes to hope, that has to be our starting place. He is our truth. He is our truth. I'm really excited that I get to go first uh, in your list of speakers because part of my job as a prophet is to lay foundations. I'm all about foundations. And when it feels rocky, I'm digging away and I'm looking at the foundations to see what needs to be changed. And I'm good at that. God's done that in my life. And I know that it makes people uncomfortable very often uh, because we've been only taught in the West for a lot of the time we've been taught that anything to do with prophecy has to be happy and blissful and full of joy. And there's nothing ever strong about it or anything that could be um, maybe misconstrued as judgment or, you know, old, old covenant. But I am called as a prophet to root up, to tear down, but then to build correctly. And the only way that is possible is because of the love of Jesus Christ and the power of that love and the power then of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in my life. And because of that, I can say to you all right at the very beginning that you are called today to step out of resignation and victimization. And you are called to begin to fight for yourself in the name of Jesus and walk into hope in the name of Jesus, as the Spirit of God has intended for your life from before the foundations of the earth. That is where our hope is, in a God who has called us from before we were even in our mother's womb to a life filled with life and a life filled with hope. So what is hope? If I would ask you, I know you would give me different answers, all of you. And probably if I was there in the room, I would make this interactive and we'd have a back and forth about it. But that's not to happen this year. So hope in general terms, if you look outside of Christianity, 
uh, outside of the Christian understanding, it's basically a wish. You say, I hope this is going to happen. And it's like you're crossing your fingers and you're making a wish for something. And you're hoping that it will happen. That is secular hope. That is outside of the Christian understanding. But hope actually comes uh, from something different. Godly hope. Uh, worldly hope comes from a position of not knowing. It comes from uncertainty. But godly hope is completely different. Ha <laughs> ha. Biblical hope says this, that you confidently expect what God has promised. You confidently expect what God has promised. And that rests upon our knowledge and understanding of his faithfulness to us. We sang that beautiful song earlier. All my days you have been faithful. All my days you have been faithful. Ha <laughs> ha. That's what godly hope rests upon it rests on our knowledge and understanding and embracing his faithfulness and those and embracing those who will walk with us in that kind of understanding and that kind of hope cannot be shaken and that's what god is doing in us right now he's shaking us so that where we are uh building our lives on hope that is just a wish he is shaking that and saying, come on, I have something better for you. I have something deeper for you. I don't want my people of God. I don't want my people walking in weakness. I want them walking in the strength and the health that my hope actually brings. True hope comes only from God. And you and I need to know that deep, deep within our knowers. And we think we know it until something dark happens, don't we? We think we know that we're pretty grounded and we're pretty firm. I can remember some really hard things happening when I was in my 40s. And I remember thinking, man, I'm a mature, I was, I was a mature Christian woman. What happened that I got here? God was shaking my roots and my foundations and showing me what my life was actually rested upon and that it was not secure. My hope was not in him as it needed to be. And you wonder how this looks and sounds today? Well, let's make it really practical. Just look and listen. This is how this is um, a, a mirror that you can hold up to yourself, actually. So just look and listen to all the complaining that's coming out of the mouths of Christians right now in this day. We we murmur and complain and we speak about the pandemic in a negative way. Uh, we speak negatively about the government and how they should be doing this and they should be doing that. We complain about our rights and how we shouldn't have to be locked down and we should be doing this and this. And actually what we're doing is revealing the state of our hearts. We're revealing how hopeless we actually feel and that we have we're revealing the hopelessness that we've actually bought into. We've resigned ourselves to a reality that isn't godly. And we're, and we're still expecting the kingdoms of this earth to correct everything and to bring us happiness, to bring us for freedom and to bring us fulfillment. Ha <laughs> ha. But God is shaking those things because he is after your hope. He wants to be your hope. He is jealous over you and he wants you to trust in him no matter what. And he wants you to trust in him first. Before everyone else, he says, you will have no other gods before me. He wants to be first. And that there are many of us who put our hope in financial security. But that won't give you hope. That won't give you security. Let me tell you, and I know that there are those who are in the, the world of finance right now. That world is being shaken to the core right now. You cannot get a hope. Uh, from a husband and wife or a spouse. They can only give you hope and security as much of, uh, as they can control events around you. But you and I both know that that is very limited because of humanity, our human limits. So that isn't a place to put your hope. Material possessions, just like finance, they cannot bring you security and they cannot uh, be a resting place for your hope. 
because they can be gone in a flash. I remember when our house flooded, when I lived in Winnipeg and we lost the basement and all the things that were in the basement, all the precious things that I had saved from my children growing up, we lost it all, material possessions. And suddenly I realized they're just possessions and they're gone. And now what am I gonna do? And so I had a little cry and I realized my hope is not in these things. My hope is in God. And yet we're a people, even though I've read you this list, we're a people, particularly in the West, especially in the West, which includes all of us, uh, and unless there's people on here from other nations that I don't see. Uh, in the West, we spend hours and hours of time and energy pursuing what we think will keep us set up for the future. Hours and hours of time. I bet you if you wrote down how much time you spent in a day seeking God or doing something that he asked you to do and how much time you spent over these other issues that I, that I read out, I think there would be a real imbalance. I know in my life, there would be some areas that the, the scales would not look pretty. <laughs> and so I would encourage you uh, to, to take a look at your life and ask the Lord to show you where things are, are out of whack right now. But anyway, I am not saying that because I think that God doesn't want to bless you. Of course, I believe he wants you walking in blessing. I believe he wants you healthy. He wants you whole. He wants you to walk in abundance. But he's going to define what the abundance is. And I am saying what I am actually saying, sorry, is that we have misplaced hope in our lives. And the Spirit of God, I believe, is allowing them to be shaken right now because He wants all of you. He wants all of your hope. He wants all of your attention. So how can you tell if you're living in hope? How can I know? How do I know if I'm trusting God to that level? You know, God, you can ask him. That's one way of finding out because he is not, we're in friendship with him. He's our father. He's our lover. He's our friend. He's our master. He wants to have dialogue with us and we can ask him. But here's a question you can ask yourself. Are you willing to obey immediately? You've got to have that word immediately. What he asks of you to do. Are you willing to walk with him in that measure? If not, may I suggest that there might be something broken in your relationship with him around this subject of hope. If you're not willing to go with him or to follow him or to speak up, if he says speak up or to do something that he asks you to do, you need to ask some questions. So disappointment is sitting somewhere on your personal timeline that with God that is harming you and keeping you crippled and keeping you outside of the hope that he has for you. Another thing that can hinder us is unforgiveness. That's a huge one. We always hear about unforgiveness, but we need to hear it again and again and again and again. I need to hear it again and again. What happens is that it produces an unwillingness in us to give ourselves to the most high in the way that he's asking us. We don't like the cost. We don't want to lay down our lives. We don't want to forgive. But he is calling us in this season to make sure that this isn't being a hindrance to the hope that he wants us to carry. Put your hope in me, the Spirit of God is saying. And the message today at this conference is actually simple. I don't know how the others are going to approach it. They're each going to come at this, I'm sure, from a different angle. But the message is simple. Keep your hope in me. Make sure it is godly hope that you are living your life with. It is his will to fill him with your, to fill you with himself. That is what God's desire is. It says this in Romans, may the God, this was Paul, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust 
in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read it again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul isn't talking about cheerleader kind of hope, rah, 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 or cheerleader kind of joy. You know that he had a very difficult life when he decided to follow Jesus, but he knew the God of hope even when he was imprisoned. Now, obviously, he's talking about being filled to overflowing with hope, but we can't be if there is no room in us for that kind of hope. And so we need to get rid of some of this other stuff that we're carrying. So if you're sitting in despair or you're sitting in disappointment right now and you're hanging on to it, you can know for sure that it was not God who took you to that place. It wasn't God because he would not take you there and he would not leave you there. There are several verses in the Bible that tell us this, and some of them are in the book of Job. We're not going to go there, but you can go and read that. I noticed that on your flyer, there's a verse from the book of Job. But Job as well had a very, very difficult life. But the most well-known verse uh, that we talk about when we look at this subject of hope is from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah 29 verse 11, and I'm sure you all know it from memory it says this for i know the plans i have for you declares the lord plans for welfare in other words your well-being and for, not for evil and to give you a future and to give you a hope that is what jeremiah the prophet was saying we love to quote that verse we absolutely love it but what happens is we forget to read what comes before that verse. We forget about that part. God's plans are of hope for us are often conditional. Ha <laughs> ha, like prophetic words that don't happen if we don't look for what the conditions are and then line ourselves up with what the word is saying so that his purpose can come to pass. And we don't like it in this day and age to think of a God being a God who has conditions. We think that's a little bit Old Testament or Old Covenant, but that is not the God that I know. That is not the God that I serve. He actually has unconditional love for us. He loves us without measure and without condition, and he welcomes us to himself just as we are. The cross of Jesus Christ, him laying down his life on the cross, bought us that kind of conditional, unconditional love. But the resurrection took us into the hope of God. And there are conditions attached to that kind of lifestyle. So we don't like to hear about that conditional side of God. It's true. But it is a good, good thing. Haha, <laughs> the resurrection is the part of, of the life of Christ that brings us hope for the future. He guaranteed our future by rising from the dead. So you can have salvation, forgiveness, and love by accepting Jesus and the sacrifice he made on the cross. But then he's calling us today into the hope of the resurrection. Ha <laughs> ha. It's much, much more than a ticket into eternal life. Much, much more. <laughs> so let's go back and look quickly at that scripture in Jeremiah. You can go home later and look at the whole thing. Uh, let's look at the conditions that God, uh, through the prophet, set out for the people. Now, the prophet was speaking to the remnant of people who were sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And he told them in that chapter, in chapter 29, he said, I want you to build houses in the place you have been exiled, and I want you to live in the houses. I want you to plant gardens to put down roots in the place where you are exiled. I want you to marry and have children there. In other words, he didn't want them living life as if they were trying to escape. 
How many of us live life thinking, oh, won't it be nice if Jesus would just come back? Beam me up, Jesus. Get me out of this. <laughs> and God was saying through the prophet, no. There's an even bigger one than those, that one I've just mentioned so far. He goes further and he says, seek the welfare of the city where you are exiled, for in its welfare you will find yours. And what was it that he promised in, in uh, verse uh, 11 of the chapter, which follows these things? He says, I have, I have plans for your welfare. And so God is saying, come on, people. Don't live like you're trying to get out of this place. You are exiled. I'm very aware that you are exiled. And this is how I want you to live in the land that you are not happy with right now. I want you to live, to build houses, to flourish, to have children and not live distracted. I want you to bless the city. I want you to bless the government. I want you to do things that will help the city that you live in because in doing that, you will find goodness for yourself. And that's hope. That is hope. Ha <laughs> ha. And then he prophesied, Jeremiah, he prophesied about the bless me prophets. The prophets who always just talk about, oh, isn't it going to be nice? And isn't it going to be, you know, we're all, it's all nice and it's all easy. And, you know, none of this hardship is for us. And, you know, and he says, they have not been standing in the counsel of the Lord. They are false prophets and they are offering false hope. The scriptures talk about truth setting you free. Truth setting you free. And the word for truth in that, those scriptures is the word we use, reality. So it's facing reality, facing truth, and standing in truth, being, bringing Christ into our reality that changes the situation from hopeless, from victimization, from resignation into a hope for a future. It requires immediate obedience and an, a willingness to align ourselves with the purposes of God. The Lord was sick and tired of false hope being pro promised to his people who were in exile and waiting to be freed. And he would not allow Jeremiah the prophet to give them false hope. God required Jeremiah to spell out the conditions. And Jeremiah, he talked about the timing of the Lord. He, I think it was 70 years. Then I will come and I will do what I have promised. And that's the kind of hope we need to walk in, to this, in this day. We are so used to, to things happening immediately. But there is a timing of the Lord for his word to come to pass. And you and I need to grow up into maturity and say yes to the timings of God. He is not our servant. He is a God who is sovereign. We serve him and we live according to his rules. And when we bring our lives into line with what he says, he releases the hope that is beyond compare. And that's what he has for us. He is tired of us being children and living and playing in the shallow waters and asking for blessing and blessing upon blessing. And he's tired of a people, especially those of us who know we are called, not willing to say yes and to lay down our lives so that his hope can be like a rushing mighty river inside of us that does burst up and overflow. And yes, that, that I'm going to read that scripture again, because it was Jeremiah talking about the timing of the Lord. He says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill my promise to you and bring you back to this place. And that's when he goes on to say and quote the verse that we love so much, for I know the plans I have for you. It's a promise that has a timing, it has conditions, but it's full of godly hope. We can expect what God says to come to pass as long as we keep walking with him in obedience with our hearts tuned towards him and a willingness to lay down and give him honor and glory. Ha <laughs> ha. 
ho. And why am I going on about it? Because the Lord wants you guys and me too to walk away from misplaced hope. He wants us to embrace this kind of hope that is secure, a hope that endures all kind of trouble and trial, this kind of hope that is, is Christ in us, the hope of glory, this kind of hope that isn't transient, it doesn't come and go with the wind, it doesn't come and go because this speaker is coming to town or that speaker. No, this hope is secure. This kind of godly hope makes you steady. It causes you to be steady says the Lord. And this kind of hope changes your behavior. It changes the words that come out of your mouth. It means that you will get over yourself because with it comes the ability to grow up. <laughs> you realize that you are not in control of your life. God is sovereign. And when you buy into that truth, when that becomes your reality, oh my goodness, all that is false begins to fall away without you even trying. And you begin to shake your head and you say, why on earth has it taken me so long to understand this kind of thing? <laughs> and this is what happens for us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It wouldn't have happened if he didn't rise from the dead, if he had stayed in the grave. But no, he rose from the grave. And this is what he purchased for us with his death and his resurrection. We can begin to understand the word of the Lord. We can begin to buy into it. We can begin to say yes. And we can begin to put our hope in him, the one who has done it all for us. He died and he rose again so that we can place our hope in him. And that is the only place that you and I dare to place our hope. Ha <laughs> ha. It always makes me uh, laugh because I think I said this earlier already, but, but um, no matter how much hope we think we have when things get difficult, this is when we realize, oh dear, maybe... <laughs> I am not doing so well in this department. But no, right now, knowing that life is difficult, you can still choose. We can still choose to live in this kind of hope. Is it hard? Oh, yes. I will. You will never hear from me talking about how life is an easy road unless the Holy Spirit releases a word through me to you that says the road ahead of you is well oiled. And he often will say that. But it doesn't mean it won't be have its challenges. And is it painful to live this way? Very painful. Come on. I miss my family. I'm in the middle of a huge challenge right now. I miss my family. I'm here by myself. My father just passed away. There have been multiple things that I have to live in hope that God is my way maker and he's sorting everything out. But uh, he will not fail me. He has been so faithful in my life and my hope is in him. And I'm secure in him that just in the same way he has always looked after me and taken care of me, he is going to do that for me going forward. And it's the same for each one of you. Absolutely the same. And so we can go with Paul in Romans. Here I'm going to read this. It says, um, he says, we also glory in our sufferings, in our difficulties, because we know that suffering produces perseverance in our lives. And perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Ha ha, there's that magic word. Hope does not put us to shame ever. It never makes a fool of us if our hope is in God, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So God doesn't shame us. And this kind of hope, like I said before, leads to changed lives. It brings joy. It'll settle you in his peace. It's alive, it's vibrant, and it brings Jesus into every element of our lifestyle, every single element. You won't even mind anymore when people say you're far too intense because you won't be able to help but be intense because you're so focused haha, on God and his kingdom. That is the God we serve. 
it brings Jesus into every, every part of our lives. And we become the burning ones that we're called to be. We don't care what people think about us. We stop worrying if people think we're weird. Who cares? We are burning for Jesus Christ when we have that kind of hope established in us. And whether we lose everything in this world or not, we get to live in a joy-filled kingdom that where the hope rests on God and what is in his kingdom, which is an eternal bed of peace, the very shalom of God. And so let's just pray. Ha <laughs> ha. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just release in the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus, your goodness into each person who's listening and watching on this video. I just pray in Jesus' name that you would shake them to the core where their hope is misplaced in Jesus' name. But Father, you would undergird them with the love of God that has been purchased for them by the blood of Jesus. I pray that you would then begin to uproot things heal their disappointments, take them further than their despair, and Lord, bring them into resurrection life with their hope set on you, who will always be faithful in the mighty name of Jesus. And where there are doubts and deceptions, we just say, go in Jesus' name, and we receive your shalom, we receive your peace, and fill us, O oh God, with a heart to obey you, and that we would burn we would burn, 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 Father, for your kingdom and your kingdom alone. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs>